good morning or good evening, depending on where you are uh, on this beautiful, warm uh, summer day. Uh, we are having this uh, webinar dialogue on, as you know, on an extremely important uh, topic and subject. But uh, I will just uh, do the sh screen share to take you through a very brief introduction of, uh, of, uh, of the organization of OPP. So uh, as you see on the screen, today's topic is about uh, Israeli and Palestinian conflict. And, and what are the really historical reasons and contemporary reasons behind it? But we'll talk more about it a bit later. Uh, <clears throat> Let me take you very quickly through the through the introduction of the organization. Uh, doing this this dialogue, uh, our purpose of our organization when we started about four and a half years ago uh, was described as OPP is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. But it's open to all nationalities. It's not just uh, a Pakistani organization. Our vision statement was just three words, unity in diversity, being based abroad, uh, living in extremely diverse societies. Uh, this was our vision. Uh, our mission is to strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. Wherever dialogues are possible, we obviously would prefer those. Uh, the, our inclinations, our political inclination is that we believe in democracy, we believe in human rights, in minority rights, and in gender equality. Uh, religiously, we believe in separation of state, of state and religion. And on the social side, we believe in integration, tolerance, acceptance, and harmony. And I would just like to add to it that we are not affiliated with any political party. Uh, we don't take funding from any political party. It's purely run by voluntary supporters and members who in every sense of the word support us. So it's a very transparent, open, uh, flat organization uh, with no huge hierarchy as you are normally used to. Let's uh, get to, uh, oh, sorry. And if you want to know more about us, about the OPP, Overseas Progressive Pakistanis, you have any one of these choices from our uh, presence on, uh, on the website to all sorts of social media platforms. You can literally reach us, read about us, call us, email us, and we are there to, to enter a discussion with you. Uh, coming back to, to today's topic, uh, this is what you have heard. Before I hand over to our extinguished uh, guests, I would like just to start this discussion with a quote from uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, who pretty nicely summed up, in fact, uh, this the, the issue we are discussing today. He said, you take my water, burn my olive trees, destroy my houses, take my job, steal my, my land, imprison my father, kill my mother, bombard my country, starve us all, humiliate us all, but I am to blame because I shot a rocket back. So I think it's, it's a powerful statement and he has summed it up uh, extremely uh, nicely. Uh, of course, I mean, it is not just all about Israel or against Israel because there are many parties involved uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this conflict. Uh, Israel, obviously, as, as, as a nation, as, as people, have all the right in the world to defend themselves, to have their identity, to practice their religion, but it shouldn't be at the cost of the others. And it is not just Israel and Palestinians. I think this is a kind of conflict where the whole world is a party to it, whether the world is indifferent, whether the world is taking wrong sides, or they are uh, uh, reacting or behaving in their own interests whether they are Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries, it, it is actually has become responsibility uh, of everyone. But I'm sure that uh, Dr. Temur is going to talk extensively about it and answer your questions on this topic. Now, before uh, I hand over the, the floor to him, with just a brief introduction. And you know from me that it's always very difficult to introduce our speakers because they are so versatile so knowledgeable and uh, such experienced people that to sum up in, in few words about them, it's extremely tough job. But, but Dr. Temur Rahman, he's an academic and a socialist political activist, an associate professor of political science at LUMS. Uh, everyone knows that famous university. Uh, and uh, 
He is, uh, among other things, he does, he is general secretary of the Mazdoor Kisan Party. Uh, and Mazdoor Kisan Party, probably younger generation might know less about it than compared to the older generation. Mazdoor Kisan Party was, the, was, was founded uh, on a May Day, on International Labor Day in 1968. And the famous names you might have heard in, in, in uh, socialist politics or left-wing politics of Afzal Bangash, uh, Sher Ali Bacha, Major Isak, these were the people who were associated with the party. And now Dr. Taimur Rahman is, uh, is carrying the torch forward as a general secretary of this party. Among many other writings, he's author of the class structure of Pakistan. He regularly delivers lectures on contemporary issues in the, in the context of political history. And on the very subject we are talking today, he has given, if I'm not mistaken, about eight or nine lectures, which are all available on, on YouTube. And they are extremely uh, important, actually, if you are interested in this, uh, in this topic. That you that you watch those uh, those those videos, uh, and with these words, I would like to welcome him as a comrade and as Dr. Tamur Rahman as our today's honourable speaker. Dr. Sab, the the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Honourable speaker, Dr. Sab, the the floor is yours. Please go ahead. If you want to share any slides, I will switch off the share screen so you can use it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased and uh, honored to be invited uh, by the Overseas Progressive Pakistanis and to address you on this extremely important subject of what is going on with respect to Israel and Palestine. Now, before I walk you through some of the timeline, what I'm going to try and do is I'll take about 40 minutes to talk about the conflict itself, and then we can open up the floor for questions and answers and so on. But before I walk you through some of the uh, uh, some of the events that have occurred in history, how Israel was founded and how the um, struggle, uh, the Palestinian struggle against Israel came together and so on and so forth. I want to impress upon your mind that the discourse, uh, as far as Muslims are concerned, and as far as, let's say, a country like Pakistan is concerned, is uh, a discourse that, uh, with respect to Israel-Palestine, is a discourse that primarily, primarily extracts from a much older medieval discourse, which is the discourse of the Crusades. So in this particular discourse, uh, the understanding is that the Israel-Palestine conflict is nothing but a continuation of the old Crusades. Now this, this, this view, this narrative can also be found amongst people who are Palestinians themselves and amongst people who are Arabs and uh, generally it's a, it's a widespread narrative amongst Muslims and especially it's become more widespread, I think since September 11th and um, uh, more recently, the rise of uh, religious politics in Pakistan. So the first thing that I want to, to say when I begin this lecture is that this is a completely outdated discourse. In fact, Europe under, underwent a very dramatic transformation uh, in which uh, Europe completely overthrew the political, ideological hegemony of the church and the cultural hegemony of the church, experienced a scientific revolution, experienced an entire period of enlightenment, became secular in its orientation, adopted capitalism and so on and so forth. So this is not the same Europe as the Europe that came and conquered uh, uh, you know, Muslim heartlands during the Crusades, much has changed. But secondly, perhaps more importantly, behind every religious uh, uh, discord or behind every religious conflict actually there are there is a there are class conflicts there are national conflicts there are ethnic conflicts there are conflicts of another nature that are going on and what i'll try to impress upon you upon the audience today is exactly that with respect to israel and palestine now one of the most significant features of the fact of the transformation of europe from a primarily a you know a society dominated by religion to a society dominated by rational Enlightenment ideas is, uh, in, uh, in particular with respect to this conflict, is the fact that, and this is often misunderstood, especially amongst Muslims, is the fact that Zionism is not a religious movement. Uh, Zionism is a movement of Jewish nationalism, certainly. But uh, what I'll try to show you today is that, in fact, uh, number one, that uh, Zionism is completely different from Judaism. These two things are not the same thing. They are, uh, Zionism is a political movement. Judaism is an ancient religion. And secondly, that the two are quite distinct and separate from each other. So the, the other major point is my daughter who's just joined me. <laughs> uh, so the other major point with respect to that is that since Zionists are not 
or not all Jews are Zionists and not all Zionists are in fact Jews. This is also uh, may come as a bit of a surprise to many of you because uh, the, the origins of uh, Zionism originate in fact in, uh, in uh, some fundamentalist Christians. I mean, a seminar, I'll talk to you later. Oh, Mama Jari, So the, uh, the other second point that I want to make with that is that uh, Palestinian nationalism itself, as it came to be formed in the 1930s and later in the 1940s, uh, is not uh, really, um, is completely secular in its orientation. And in the origins of Palestinian nationalism, Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims came together to form the early uh, understanding behind Palestinian nationalism, even though Palestinian uh, Christians are only 1% of all Palestinians. But this historic accord plays a very important role uh, because of the way in uh, and, and shapes the way Palestinian nationalism is formed. So this is the second thing I'm going to try and show you is that Palestinian nationalism as uh, encapsulated by the PLO was entirely secular. Now, when we talk about the discourse in Muslim societies, what we discover is that um, most uh, of your Islamic political parties fall into various conspiracy theories with respect to uh, what is going on in Israel and Palestine. Uh, many of them sadly think that the protocols of the elders of Zion is something that they can go by to try and understand uh, something about what the Jews are doing in, in the context of Israel, etc. In fact, I've tried to show in the first video that this particular doc doctrine, this particular document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, is a complete fabrication. It is a, a, a document which was plagiarized. And really, it is the document which is, uh, you could say, like the manifesto for uh, anti-Semitism across Europe. So to adopt this particular document as a basis for our analysis of what's going on in Israel, Palestine is not only historically completely inaccurate, uh, but also opens up the Palestinian movement and all those who are uh, uh, trying to work for the rights of Palestinians um, as being anti-Semitic. <clears throat> and of course, given Europe's history with anti-Semitism and given that in Europe, uh, six million Jews were murdered by Nazis uh, because they were they belonged to Judaism. Any hint of anti-Semitism means essentially that Europe and the, and, and the West as a whole will be completely reluctant in any way, shape or form, not just the governments, but even the people to support any kind of movement that is any way connected to any Nazi, fascist or anti-Semitic ideology. So that's why I think it's very important for us to recognize these things and to understand what really is going on. Now, when we examine how Israel was formed, we know that Palestine was basically under Ottoman rule from 1516. Uh, it was a province of the Ottoman Empire. Of course, we can go back into the ancient history of Palestine. We can look at the Philistines. We get the word, the English word Philistine really comes from uh, you know, and the word Palestine, they really are, have the same roots. But anyway, we'll skip ahead of all that ancient history, skipping ahead of the formation and then the dest destruction of Israel by Babylon, etc. Come all the way up to Ottoman rule in 1516. So um, essentially, Palestine was under Ottoman rule. There was a brief period in the 19th century where the Ottomans and the Egyptians fought each other for control over Palestine. Um, now, as the Ottoman Empire was falling apart, it was in this time that uh, Britain and France in particular thought that they wanted to capture these provinces of the Ottoman Empire. They wanted to divide these provinces up. So in this particular case, in 1916, as World War I was waging, they came up with an agreement called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, in which they basically partitioned the Ottoman provinces of the Middle East. That is, of course, Palestine, but also Syria, Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera. So the northern part was taken, was, it was agreed between the British and French that the northern part would be taken over by the French and the southern part, that is what is Palestine and Jordan, will be taken over by the British. At the, at the very same time that this was going on, the British also made another declaration called the Balfour Declaration, where they tried to convince the Jewish community that the Jewish community should continue this supporting the war effort 
uh, they should continue supporting World War One. They should even put pressure on the Tsar to continue to support World Brit Britain and France, uh, you know, and Russia and keep Russia in World War One. And in exchange for that, uh, Lord Balfour declared that uh, His Majesty's government uh, views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So at this particular point in time, Christian Zionists also began to advocate that Jews should essentially leave Europe. To understand this, we have to understand that um, in Europe, uh, after the Enlightenment, France was arguably one of the first countries to in fact embrace equal rights for Jews. And uh, Jews started to thrive and do quite well. They came out of the ghetto and began to diversify into other forms of life. Germany followed, etc. And as they began to en enter other uh, aspects of life because previously under Christian rule they were confined to certain areas called ghettos and they were confined to certain professions. For instance, they could not participate in agriculture and so on and so forth. Now when other fields were open to them, they began to diversify and they were doing well. And because they were doing well, there was amongst uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, amongst certain European parties, there was resentment for the Jews who were actually assimilating and doing well in Europe. And those people wanted to get rid of the Jews from Europe. So they began a movement that we call Christian Zionism. And the idea of Christian Zionism is let's build a homeland for the Jews in their holy land. They should go back there and leave Europe alone. So the origins of Zionism are actually not even amongst the Jewish community, but amongst the Christian community who wanted to actually expel the Jews from Europe, send them out somewhere else so that they could have a pure uh, uh, Europe that would be free of the Semites. Now, this is a very interesting part of Zionism, but it was from these ideas that Theodor Herzl took Took, took an idea. In 1896, there was the Dreyfus affair in which a, a Jewish officer in France was accused of a treason. And, uh, in, you know, there was a great swell of anti-Semitic feeling. And Theodore Herzl from that thought that it would not be possible for Jews to assimilate into Europe, although they were rapidly assimilating into Europe. So at that time, he wrote his famous uh, uh, essay. And with that, he formed the World Zionist Organization. Uh, and, uh, at first, and he wanted to convince uh, the big states of Europe to support uh, the World Zionist Organization and to help him build a home in Israel. He was even ready to build a home in Argentina or Uganda. Israel was only one of the options that he presented. Now, um, in the 1920s, from the 1920s till the 1930s, there was immigration from Europe into what is Pal Palestine, Israel today. Uh, but this was very, very tiny and small. And if we read uh, historians, uh, Khalid Rashidi, for example, or others, Ilan Pape, et cetera, what we discover is that the uh, Muslims and, uh, and the Christians who lived in Palestine were not too concerned that uh, maybe about a couple of, you know, a, a thousand uh, Jews have, from Europe had come to to live there, they were not too concerned about this fact. In fact, uh, to a very large extent, they welcomed them because this was not in a, in a big enough uh, uh, quantity that they should be worried. But what the Palestinians were more concerned about at that point in time was of course, British rule over there, which had been established in 1920 as the League of Nations gave the mandate to, to, to Britain to rule that particular area. So in 1920 and then later in 1929 and 1933, 1936, uh, Palestinians revolted against the British. And at that time, um, the, the Jewish, the small Jewish community continued to support the British against the Arabs, against the Palestinians. By 1933, of course, Hitler had come to power. And now as fascism began to rise in Europe, uh, Jews began to run away from, from Europe and uh, the uh, trickle of Jews that was coming into Palestine now turned much larger. And as World War II, of course, opened up and as it was discovered how millions of people had been murdered by the Nazis, then of course, many, many Jews wanted to leave and wanted to come to, uh, to Palestine. Principally, the region from uh, which the most Jews emigrated to Palestine was really Eastern Europe. 
because that's where the persecution of Jews was the worst, Poland, etc. And um, that's where the quantity of Jews was also the greatest. So, so they began to emigrate uh, to a greater and greater number. In 1939, the British placed a sort of a, a law which stated that uh, only 10,000 Jews per annum would be allowed to come to Palestine. So at that time, the Zionists then turned against the British. They turned against the British and they formed various organizations, the Levy, the Haganah, the Stern Gang, etc. And they started to fight against the British, even though the British were fighting against the Nazis, who were the worst enemies really of the Jews at that point in time. So um, uh, the Holocaust, of course, created a huge uh, precedent, uh, you know, and it created a huge, uh, in, in European society, it created enormous remorse and regret and guilt for what had happened, what had transpired, and how you know millions of people had been killed merely on account of their ethnicity, merely on account of their religion, merely, merely on account of their national identity. And because being Semitic, of course, is an ethnicity. Uh, people, people often forget that uh, Palestinians are also Semites and uh, so on, but uh, many, many Arabs are in fact also Semites, et cetera. But anyway, so the United, the, so this entire issue came to the United Nations and the United Nations basically decided under the General Assembly Resolution 181 that they would divide Palestine and give half of it nearly to, uh, to uh, the, you know, Palestinians, the Arabs, etc., and give half of it to uh, to Jews. Now, this was not a solution uh, that was, uh, I think, favored. But in the circumstances, the United Nations, I mean, the United Nations would ideally, I think, have liked to, for all these people to have lived together. Uh, but uh, by that time, the situation had become so bad that uh, they felt that maybe this was the best solution. As soon as this partition plan uh, you know, came about, it was in November 1947, the following year in April 1948, um, the uh, 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 Israel um, and the Zionists within Israel had already started going to war to clear certain areas so that the Jewish state could be established. And this uh, one particular massacre called the Der Yassin massacre was particularly brutal, which caused the exodus of uh, the, the, the resulting panic caused the exodus of about uh, took the keys so, because they expected that they'd be, they'd be back after this, you know, this conflict, et cetera, was over. But of course, that was never to be. Uh, in May 1948, Israel declared its independence. And as, as soon as it did so, the very next day, seven countries, seven Arab countries invaded Israel and tried to, to defeat it. These were Egypt, Transjordan, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. The war lasted for 10 months, but the, Arab, the seven Arab countries lost the war. Now, a mythology has been created in, in, uh, in um, Israel that they were vastly outnumbered. In fact, this was not the case. Uh, Israel very quickly mobilized its people. And overall, the only effective army that the, um, uh, that the uh, Arabs really had was the Jordanian army at that time. Uh, and the Jordanian army was fighting under the British and its interests were only with respect to the West Bank, et cetera. So anyway, now as Israel began to settle down, they had, their main issue was that they needed, on the one hand, they wanted to expel the Arabs so that they could have the land. And on the other hand, they wanted the conquest of land. One of the central Zionist ideas was the conquest of land. Because if you recall, the Jews were prohibited from agriculture. So here now they wanted to settle the land and form kibbutz and so on, where they would uh, create these new Zionist uh, uh, communes and live there. By 1952, a, a new wave of Arab nationalism was now sweeping across Egypt and then later Syria, Iraq, etc. Uh, the free officers movement came to power. They thought that the, that the defeat in the 1948 war to Israel was because of King Farouk and because uh, the uh, Egypt was still stuck in its old feudal ways. So this was a national liberation movement. It was closely aligned at that time to the Waf party and so on.
Swiss Canal back into Egyptian, or rather they wanted to have Swiss Canal into Egyptian control. In 1956, that's exactly what they did. They nationalized the Swiss Canal. As a consequence of the nationalization of, Swiss, of the Swiss Canal, things escalated very quickly. Britain and France attacked Egypt. Israel joined them, egging them on, pushing them on. And the Soviet Union came and defended uh, Egypt in a very, very big way. So the war was stopped. The Swiss Canal became part of Egyptian territory now. Nasser won a great victory. And because of that victory, a wave, a, a revolutionary nationalist wave swept over Arabian countries. Nasser was the most celebrated hero after 1956 in all of Arabia. And revolutions followed one after another. Uh, there was a revolution, of course, in Iraq, which was massive, which the Americans tried to support by landing GIs in, in Lebanon, but that didn't work. Then Syria and Egypt decided to form one state, uh, which was called the United Arab Republic. And suddenly Egypt became very powerful because Syria and Egypt became one country. In Yemen, there was a revolution against the, uh, the monarchy over there and the Egyptians supported the Yemenis revolution as well. Uh, it was very likely that Jordan was on the brink of a revolution. It was very likely that Jordan too would experience a revolution. So basically revolution was sweeping across the, uh, across the Arabian um, heartland. Now the, Israelis became extremely, extremely concerned about the rise of Nasserism. Now, Nasser, Na, Nasserism was really a secular movement, a totally secular movement. Uh, at first, they were very close to the Juan al Muslimin, but when Nasser began to move in favor of land reforms, the Juan al Muslimin moved against Nasser, tried to assassinate him, failed in assassinating him, and thereafter the division completely changed. Now, Nasser and all the forces associated with Nasser were aligned with the Soviet Union. And Ikhwan al-Muslimin was aligned with the United States of America. For, uh, uh, you know, and uh, through a uh, indirect means, of course, through Israel. <coughs> so now this, this was the alignment during the Cold War that secular nationalists were aligned with the Soviet Union, whereas the religious right, what we call today Islamic fundamentalist parties, were aligned with the United States of America which of course was the principal supporter of Israel. Now, Israel began a preemptive strike in 1967. This is called the Six Day War because they were very concerned about uh, Nasser's growing popularity and his strength. The Soviet Union was arming both Egypt as well as Syria and also Iraq, of course. And they were very concerned about this and they felt that the major threat to them now came from Egypt principally, also to some extent Jordan, uh, but with Jordan, they were having many, many, you know, just under the surface, they, with Shah Hussein, they were having a lot of dialogue. So they were not that concerned about Jordan, but they were very concerned about Syria and Egypt in particular. So in 1967, they attacked Egypt. They had a preemptive strike. And in six days, they managed to defeat Egypt, mainly because of the, the superiority of air power. They were able to destroy the Egyptian air force very, very quickly and gained a fundamental victory. Nasser, of course, was devastated. He offered to resign. He did in fact resign, but the public would have none of it. The public supported him and wanted him to stay in power. But 1967 war marked also what you could say sort of the decline or the beginning of the decline of Nasserism and Pan-Arab socialism at the, because it was defeated now or seemed to be defeated at least by Israel. Now the focus shifts from, from Egypt and Syria to Jordan uh, because the, the Palestinians that had left um, uh, you know, the West Bank and other areas of Israel had all moved across the Jordan River and moved into what was then Transjordan and later became Jordan. So the Jordan uh, as a country has 50%, nearly half of its population of course, is made up of Palestinians. So Palestinians in these refugees, refugee camps began to organize. First, Arafat set up a group in Kuwait. Then he moved to Syria. From Syria, he moved to Jordan. And in Jordan, he uh, by that time, there was a very important battle called the Battle of Karama, in which the Israelis fought uh, Fatah. And uh, Fatah gave them a very, very difficult and tough time. And because of that, although Arab armies had lost in the 67 war, because Fatah had managed to fight well against the Israelis, instantaneously Arafat became a, a massive hero all across the Arab world. And uh, the Arafat 
a member of the PLO, in fact, to lead the PLO. The PLO had been formed earlier by Egypt. Uh, it had been formed uh, uh, much earlier under Ahmed Shukeri, etc. cetera. Uh, so now the PLO became the new organization that united all the different groups uh, and parties that were Palestinian nationalist. Now, one of the key things to understand about the PLO is that it also included many, many Christians. For example, arguably the second most popular leader in the PLO was a man named George Habash, who of course um, was a Marxist revolutionary of Christian origin. And he headed the organization called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Similarly, there was another organization called the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is another Marxist organization. And then there was of course Al-Fatah, etc. So in this way, the PLO was a very, it was a left nationalist movement. And it was very openly left nationalist and very openly secular in its orientation. In fact, in the charter of PLO, they were opposed to, they made it a point to, to say that they're opposed to Zionism, but they're not opposed to Jews. In fact, they made it a point to stress that they're opposed to the state of Israel as a Zionist entity, but they are not opposed to Jews living in Palestine uh, under conditions of equality. Uh, so they had no, they were not trying to say that we're going to kill all the Jews and expel them. So, uh, but rather that they had a political battle against the Zionism as a political project. They were not against, they were not anti-Jewish. And of course it goes, as it should be stated without any equivocation that they were not anti-Semitic. Many of them were themselves ethnically Semite. So now uh, in, uh, by uh, September, 1970, the PLO had become so big and powerful in Jordan that it almost seemed like the PLO was running Jordan. Shah Hussein was very, very worried. He uh, wanted to get rid of the PLO and that's exactly what he did in September, 1917. The Jordanian army attacked the PLO. The Pakistan, uh, some uh, certain, you know, uh, the general, sorry, Brigadier Zia at that time was stationed in, pa in, Palestine, in, sorry, in Jordan and uh, he was commanding Pakistani troops who in fact helped the Jordanian army defeat the PLO. The PLO was eventually defeated. They formed an organization called Black September, not, sorry, not the entire PLO, but certain people in the PLO formed Black September, you know, which, uh, uh, which obviously undertook certain terrorist uh, attacks in the Munich Olympics in particular. Uh, and, um, but by 1972, PLO was finished within, Jordan. Now PLO mainly moved to Lebanon. It set up its camp in Lebanon. But by 1974, PLO had been accepted by the states of the world, not only as the sole representative organization of the Palestinian people, but in fact, this guerrilla army or guerrilla movement now had been given observer status at the United Nations, which, was unique, which is unique in the history of the United Nations itself. In 1917, Nasser had passed away, and now Anwar Sadat came to power. He uh, played a sort of brinksmanship sort of role with the, the Israelis, but in 1970 through, sorry, 73, armed with new Soviet weapons, including SAM missile batteries and, uh, uh, you know, MiG-21s, SA-2s and SA-3s, SA-6 and anti-aircraft missiles, T-55, T-62 tanks, and so on and so forth, and the Sagar missile, which was a you know, portable missile which could be fired, uh, which is an anti-tank guided missile. These proved to be very decisive. So he uh, fought the Israelis in 1973, and this was a, a pretty tough war in which the Israelis could not get the upper hand so easily. Finally, the matter went to the United Nations and also the United States of America wanted these two powers to disengage. The US then finally did manage to get the two powers not just to disengage, uh, but they managed to convince Egypt to uh, recognize Israel and to cease all hostilities with Israel in the future. Uh, and in exchange for that, uh, of course, not only did they get back the Sinai Peninsula, which the Israelis had conquered in the 67 war, uh, they got back the canal, which also the Israelis had conquered in 67. Um, so they were able to get back most of their, if not, I'm sorry, they were able to get back all of their territory. And Egypt became one of the largest recipients of American assistance after that point after Camp David. Uh, and this is mainly because Egypt agreed to move out of the Soviet sphere, move into the American sphere and promise never to attack Israel again, promise to, uh, uh, you know, to, to recognize Israel and to make a peace treaty.
It was because of this peace treaty and because of the Camp David Accords, etc., that um, uh, religious fundamentalists then assassinated uh, uh, Anwar Sadat in 1982. Now the, the, atten the, the focus shifts from, I would like to shift the focus from Egypt, from Jordan to Egypt, from now from Egypt back to, sorry, to Lebanon. Uh, in Lebanon, the situation was that the Lebanon had been formed after the Second World War, and in Lebanon they had a pact. Uh, there were three, four major ethnic groups. They are the Maronite Christians, of course, the Druze, the Muslims, both Shia and Sunni. And they had formed a Maronite pact, which was a sort of sectarian agreement, unwritten pact in 1943, whereby they said that the Maronite Christians will not seek Western intervention. Muslims will not seek to unite Lebanon with Syria, because at one time Lebanon was part of Syria. Uh, they decided that the president will always be a Christian, the speaker will be a Shia, the prime minister will be a Sunni Muslim, the deputy speaker will be Greek Orthodox, the deputy prime minister will also be Greek Orthodox, the chief of general staff of the armed forces will always be a Druze, and, um, and there will always be a six to five ratio in favor of Christians to Muslims in the Lebanese parliament. So this was a very sectarian uh, setup in the sense that every sect had a certain role in it. And uh, as Nasserism was sweeping across uh, Arab countries, it had a huge impact also on Lebanon. In Lebanon now, we had, the, uh, we had politicians, especially amongst the Muslims, who wanted to be part of the UAR. They wanted Lebanon to be part of the United Arab Republic. And they led very big strikes and demonstrations that it should be part of the Lebanese Republic. But more importantly, within Lebanon, left-wing organizations came together and, uh, uh, you know, under the leadership of a very fine Arab intellectual whose name is Kamal Jumblat, uh, who was the leader of the Druze community and who formed the part, a party called the Progressive Socialist Party. Now, he led a left-wing coalition, which included a lot of other people, including the Lebanese Communist Party, which is a very important, strong party at that particular point in time. When um, this coalition was called the Lebanese National Movement. Now, when the PLO came, in, came into Lebanon, the Lebanese National Movement and the PLO uh, uh, became allies of each other. So on the one hand were the, uh, were the, was the Lebanese National Movement plus PLO, and on the other hand was what was called the Lebanese Front. The Lebanese Front was were people who belonged to the old Christian Maronite elite. The Christians of uh, Lebanon were, were always the elite of Lebanon. They didn't want to let go of that particular arrangement in which they, of course, had the upper hand, whereas the other communities, the Druze and the Shia, Sunni, etc., wanted to change that. So now this conflict sparked by, uh, you know, in 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 the context of uh, 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 Lebanon in 1975, the Lebanese civil war began. It was basically not started by the PLO. It was basically indigenous to Lebanon, and the difference, of course, was between the Lebanese Front, which was a right-wing, pro-American, and also pro-fascist organization. The main party in that organization were called the Phalangists. Phalange means, of course, uh, Kataib, which is, means a column, which is, uh, uh, you know, was taken from Italian fascism. So they were inspired by Italian fascism back in the 1930s. So the, the, this party was a very key and important party. The uh, Bashir Gamal was one of their main sort of militant leaders who also became president of Lebanon for a very short time until he was assassinated. Now, as the civil war got, uh, got, uh, started getting worse, the Syrians uh, uh, took a mandate from the, from the Arab League and invaded uh, Lebanon in order to keep the peace. Uh, their reason for invading Lebanon had to do with the fact that they thought that Lebanon was always being used as a base to attack Syria. They wanted to prevent Lebanon from falling into into uh, Israeli hands and so on and so forth. They also wanted to control PLO and so on and so forth. And uh, Syrian nationalists also want, always wanted Lebanon to be part of uh, Syria. Uh, now, I try and understand that in, the, in, the, in this very period, while the civil war is also going on, the PLO is also fighting Israel on the border between Lebanon and Israel. So Israel uh, wanted to control the PLO after the coastal road massacre in which PLO people hijacked a bus and killed people on this coastal road, um, the Israeli army then launched Operation Litani, which was that they basically took over the area of Lebanon under uh, the river Litani, which sort of goes like this and then goes up. So 
under that river, South Lebanon, they basically took over. By 1979, the Iranian revolution began and Lebanese politics was very much influenced by the Iranian revolution. So we saw eventually the rise of Iranian, so, sort of Iranian Shiite inspired, inspired militias. Amal was the first one from Amal, then later Hezbollah also came into being. By 1982, Israel was so fed up of PLO attacks that they decided that they are going to invade Lebanon as a whole. They're going to go all the way to Beirut and crush the PLO. That's exactly what they did with a massive force. 70,000 soldiers, they invaded Lebanon, they went all the way to Beirut, attacked Arafat, etc., tried to kill him, didn't manage. Arafat still managed to appeal to international opinion and the and, uh, and a multinational force was sent to evacuate Arafat as well as the PLO leadership from um, uh, from uh, Beirut. He was evacuated. First, he was moved to Tripoli. From Tripoli, he was moved to Greece. From Greece, he was moved to to set up its headquarters. Um, unfortunately, Kamal Jumblet was uh, assassinated. It is said that he was assassinated by the uh, by the Syrians and the Lebanese national movement. After his assassination, over time, basically, the uh, uh, you know, collapsed. Uh, there were many, many differences emerged, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also it collapsed because uh, uh, Hezbollah kind of organizations were being supported both by Iran as well as, well as by Syria, and they became they became much more powerful in the region. Um, by the time that Arafat and now the PLO, given that they were now in the 1980s, they were sitting in Tunis. Where, from where they could organize no major attack against Israel. They could organize no major revolution against Israel. They were completely separated, secluded, etc. So they thought that it's, uh, that, um, you know, they, they lost any territory from where they can undertake the national liberation movement. They started in Syria, they couldn't continue there. They went to Lebanon, they couldn't continue there. Egypt had never allowed them to use their territory to attack um, Israel anyway. Uh, and then they were in Lebanon from which they had to, uh, you know, they were expelled by the Israelis. And now they were in, you know, sitting in Tunis, in Tunisia, which was far away. And so, um, so there they, they, they were completely isolated. Um, so, sorry, I think I, I uh, may have made a mistake when I said that Arafat was moved, I believe he was moved to Tripoli first and then he moved. Anyway, so Arafat decided that, uh, that he had to find some way for the PLO to move back into areas from where they, were, they would be connected to Palestinian people. That opportunity presented itself in 1987 when the first Intifada began. This was sparked by a traffic accident uh, in which uh, an Israeli uh, person hit some Muslims and that sparked outrage. But its significance was that this was the first time uh, that Palestinians that lived within the borders of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of what we could consider historic Palestine, as well as living within the borders of what we would consider to be Israel itself, uh, rose up against the Israeli state. So utilizing that opportunity, Arafat then began what is called uh, the Oslo process, which in 1993 uh, uh, finalized as the Oslo Accord. Now, the key thing to understand about this Oslo Accord is that the 1982 invasion of Lebanon and the massacre of Palestinians, especially in Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, created a massive backlash within Israel, where 400,000 Israelis came out onto the streets of Tel Aviv and said, we don't want the Israeli state to be at war in Lebanon, to be at war in Jordan, to be at war with Egypt, to be at war with Syria. We want peace. So there was a now after the invasion of Lebanon within Israel, there was a massive peace movement. When I say this 400,000 people, remember that that's that's 10%, and that was at that time, 10% of the Israeli population. So that, that, that shows you that if 10% of the population of a country come into one demonstration, that shows you that there are many, many people who basically support the call for peace. This uh, call for peace resulted in the victory of uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was uh, uh, the re representative of the Labour Party. Israeli politics itself has to be understood that the Zionists, the people who founded Israel, were, as I told you earlier, they were, they were social democrats as far as Jews themselves were concerned. 
they were anti-Palestinian and Arab in which were included both Christians as well as uh, Muslims. But as far as Jews themselves were concerned, they created a massive welfare state. So the party that led them was a party led by David Ben-Gurion and the name of the party was Mapai. And Mapai was part of the second international, that is the socialist international. It considered itself social democratic. It was a secular party. It even considered that it is a socialist party. Uh, but in 1978, this party was defeated by a right-wing party called the Liberal Party. They called it the Likud, although they call themselves liberal, but actually they are right-wing liberals. So they were defeated by the Likud Party. And the leader of that party is a man named um, Menachem Begin, who was in his, uh, you know, in the 1940s, uh, known as a terrorist uh, because he was part of these militias that were organized, that had organized to attack, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the British. Another key and important thing to understand is that Zionism itself is split into two, in fact, three major camps. On the one hand, of course, is the Mapai, which is what we call labor Zionism. Uh, you know, which was social democratic in its orientation. And the, on the other hand is uh, what we call uh, Likud, which is what we call revisionist Zionism. Now revisionist Zionism is much more virulent in its uh, thinking. It is also a secular movement. It claims to be liberal. Uh, its claim was that uh, the area known as West Bank, which, uh, which to the Jews, ancient Jews was known as Judea and Somalia, they feel that this area should also be under Israeli control. So West Bank should be under their control. At one time, they even felt that the entire British mandate should belong to the Zionists. So they even wanted Jordan to be part of the Zionists. So this, they call it revisionist Zionism because this is not what Theodore Herzl really wanted. So this was a revision of the doctrines of world, the World Zionist Organization. So anyway, this is revisionist Zionism, whose head was uh, Zaev uh, Jabotinsky, um, led eventually to the formation of the Likud, and Likud came to power in 78. But now with the peace movement, Likud was defeated and Rabin came to power and uh, came to power on the ticket that he would, he would build peace. So that's why then you had Oslo. And very soon after that, Oslo won in 93 was a very vague sort of agreement in which they allowed Arafat and PLO people to come back to the territory. But Oslo too was where the actual agreement and the nitty gritty of the agreement was set up. Now this was a, this is where the disaster really began because in this agreement, they broke up what would be part of the Palestinian state into three regions called area A, area B and area C. Area A was going to be controlled entirely by the Palestinians. Area B was going to be jointly controlled by the Palestinian authority and by Israel and area C was going to be controlled by Israel itself only. Now, the problem with that was that um, area A and B were further subdivided into 165 separate units. So Palestine, the Palestinian Authority as it exists today is not one contiguous territory. It's little, 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 little dots of places, 165 little dots of spaces. Uh, can you imagine? And area C uh, is an area which the Israelis are unwilling to let go of because these are areas in which there are massive Israeli settlements. These settlements are considered illegal according to the United Nations. And uh, in area C, the settlers who are, who, are, who are in fact religious Zionists, they are the only kind of people who are religious Zionists and are very extreme. Um, they've been building and building and in area C, Palestinians cannot really, uh, you know, because the area is controlled by the Israeli government, Palestinians have to apply for a permit. They don't get the permit. When they get, when they don't get the permit, they build illegally. When they build Ill illegally, the, the Israeli thought this, the government comes and breaks down uh, that state. So since 1988, Isra Israel has destroyed 17,000 Palestinian structures in this region. 70% of Palestinian villages in this area, that is area C, are without, uh, are without running water, are without any kind of water. So what's going on in area C is that the policies are structured in such a way that the Palestinians should leave and the settlers should be promoted, etc. Um, now, Rabin was assassinated in November 1995, very soon after the second Oslo uh, agreement. The reason why Oslo has come undone, in my view, is because of this way in which, is because of Oslo too, is the way in which the PA 
<coughs> has been broken up into area A, B, C. Area A and B has been broken up further into 165 little units. And the main reason why that has been done is because Israel is concerned about its security to such an extent that they are not willing to really give Palestinians a, a functional and viable state. Here's another interesting uh, piece of information. The United Nations estimates that uh, if Area C were to become part of Palestine, then the Palestinian Authority would, would uh, manage to halve their budget deficit. They also estimate that because Area C has not been made part of Palestine, this is causing a potential loss of $14 billion to the Palestinian economy, because Area C are where the natural reserves, et cetera, are. So that's why the kind of way in which the Palestinian state has been created, it's not a viable Palestinian state. And because it's not a viable Palestinian state, when the Palestinian Authority and the, um, and the Israelis went back to the table to, according to Oslo, to discuss uh, the final agreement between the PA and the, um, and the Israelis, this was in 2000 at camp called the Camp David Summit talks uh, that were negotiated by, uh, uh, Bill Clinton. So here we had five major disagreements uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. There was disagreement on territory. The Palestinians said oh, that the 1967 borders have to be the borders of Palestine. The state of Israel should be the state that existed before 67. All the territories conquered after 67, should, should, uh, Israel should leave them. Secondly, there was the question of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Uh, that Israelis want, uh, sorry, Palestinians want complete sovereignty over East Jerusalem, including its holy sites, etc. The Israelis are not ready to concede that. Then there was a question of refugees, Palestinians' right of return. Now, the you recall that about 750,000 refugees left. Now they number about 4 million. So Israelis are not ready to bring all these people back into Israel because, or even to West, into West Bank, because they fear that this will change the demographics of Israel. So they are not ready to concede on that. And then there were many other security arrangements that were not, that the Palestinians were not ready to accept. For example, Israelis wanted to place a radio station inside, a radio radar station, sorry, inside Palestine. They wanted to use airspace. They wanted to have the right to deploy troops in the case of an emergency. They wanted to station an international force in the Jordan Valley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were many things that they wanted to do which the Palestinians were not ready to agree on. And finally, uh, Arafat wanted all settlements disbanded. Israel was not ready was ready to dismantle many settlements, but not all of them. So uh, the talks failed, Arafat returned, and uh, uh, this, this really began what is called the Second Intifada, also known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada. It's known as the Al-Aqsa Intifada because Ariel Sharon decided to visit uh, the Temple Mount, that is the Al-Haram Al-Sharif, uh, armed with uh, Israeli soldiers, etc. And when he uh, came there, the Palestinians revolted very badly because Ariel Sharon is uh, the person who massacred or, or helped in the massacre of Palestinians at Shabra and Shatila. They call him the Sabra and Shatila. They call him the butcher of Palestinians. So when he came there, it just provoked Palestinians and they started fighting. So from 2000 onwards, for about three, four years, um, the Palestinians, uh, you know, uh, the population just revolted against um, Israeli authority. And this was even more brutal than the previous uh, first intifada. Now, uh, by this time, Hamas had been formed in 1988. They started to do suicide attacks, etc. And uh, another organization called the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade was formed. It was loosely allied with uh, Fatah. They started to do attacks. The PFLP, DFLP was also involved in similar attacks. So everybody basically went on the offensive. And Arafat himself was basically taken under house arrest by the Israelis in Ramallah, where he was confined to his quarters, uh, where eventually he uh, uh, you know, uh, fell ill. Uh, and uh, then he was moved to a French hospital and he uh, passed in 2004. And uh, with that, the, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Israelis had already started to construct now the, the, a wall to wall off the Palestinians from the, 
from the Israeli population. This wall, of course, has been considered to be illegal by the International Court of Justice that advises that this wall should be undone. It is incredibly discriminatory and so on and so forth. So that's where, with the Al-Aqsa Intifada, now you see that's where things more or less stand. Netanyahu has been in power till very recently and has been unwilling. There's been no further negotiation, sadly. I mean, there have been many attempts at negotiations, but there have been no further agreements between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you know, and uh, uh, is Palestinians themselves are badly divided between Gaza on the one hand and West Bank on the other, because as Hamas arose, it won the election in 2006 and uh, wanted to form the government, but um, the international community was not ready to accept it. And even Mahmoud Abbas was not ready to accept it. And there were some last minute changes that were made by Mahmoud Abbas, taking away power from the prime minister. Ironically, uh, uh, when Arafat was the president, to weaken Arafat, uh, you know, the international community put pressure on the PA to take away power from the president to delegate it to Mahmoud Abbas, who was the prime minister. Now Mahmoud Abbas was the president, but now they took away power from the PM and gave it to the president because now Hamas was going to, uh, you know, form the government, etc. Um, so as soon as Hamas tried to form the government, civil war broke out between uh, the uh, the, uh, between Fatah on the one hand and Hamas on the other, and it was a very brutal affair. In Gaza, Hamas won that war and expelled the, ex more or less expelled Fatah. And in West Bank, uh, Fatah, uh, you know, uh, dominated. And uh, so now what you have is a curious situation in which you have Gaza on the one hand with, uh, you know, with effective government really belonging to Hamas and West Bank on the other hand with effective government really belonging to, uh, to the PA to Mahmoud Abbas. Now, since Trump has been power, this brings me to the close. I know time is almost up. Uh, since Trump has been in power in 2017, Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as, the cap as, a, cap as, a, as a city that would, would belong to Israel. This, of course, has further upset Palestinians. Uh, and uh, very strongly, US says that it no longer considers Israeli settlements on the West Bank to be illegal. And under U.S. Uh, pressure, the Abraham Accords have been uh, now been signed uh, and ratified. Uh, so 164 of the 192 UN, United Nations member states today recognize Israel, United, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, UAE, Sudan, Mor Morocco, and Bahrain in August and December 2020 also recognize Israel. Pakistan has not recognized Israel. Cuba, North Korea, Venezuela has not recognized Israel. Also, the countries that do not recognize Israel are Afghanistan, Algeria, Bangladesh, Brunei, Cameroon, Djibouti, uh, Iraq, Indonesia, Iran, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Malaysia, Maldives, Mali, Niger, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Syria, uh, Tunisia, Yemen, uh, and our dearest Pakistan. So that brings us to a close. Now, I began by saying that uh, I want to impress upon you uh, a few important ideas. The first idea, of course, is that this is not a religious war in the sense that this is not the continuation of the Crusades. Europe has long given up on Christianity. It is now dominated by rational scientific ideology. And um, Zionism is, is the product of this new age of enlightenment. Zionism, as I've tried to show you, is not a religious idea. It is a nationalist idea. The people who formed it were secular Jews. The religious Jews were in fact completely opposed to Zionism. They thought that it was an absurd idea that the Jews should return to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land. For 2000 years since the exile, uh, the Jewish canon basically stated that it would be that it would be at the end of times that God would, uh, you know, uh, call back the people of uh, uh, of uh, the Jews to the Promised Land. This would be the the uh, uh, what we Muslims call the Rose Kiamat, uh, Kiamat, sorry, and that uh, you know where all the scales would be balanced, and this would be the after the coming of the Messiah and so on and so forth. So the religious Jews think that this is near, some this is like blasphemy, for because for two thousand years they although were. They go and they uh, they pray in the Holy Land, but uh, for but for all these generations, they have never had the desire or or, or 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 their religion has never advocated that they actually move back to the Holy Land. So Zionism is quite different from Orthodox uh, Judaism, and that's why you see uh, you can search the internet and you see many many Orthodox Christ, uh, Jews protesting against Zionism, even burning the Israeli flag. 
Um, and this is the real fundamental reason. So when religious, when we say this is a religious conflict, the biggest mistake we're making, of course, is that we are substituting a political project, the project of Zionism, and attacking the entire Jewish community, whereas the entire Jewish community does not support uh, the state of Israel. It does not support Zionism. Uh, and secondly, as I've tried to show you, Zionism is not restricted to people who are necessarily Jewish. There were Christian Zionists as well who wanted the creation of the state of Israel. They are also really part of the Zionism. So Zionism is a secular political project. Not all the Jews are Zionists. Not all Zionists are Jews. So our problem really is with Zionism that has set up the state of Israel. Our problem is not with uh, Jews that um, uh, live in other parts of the world or even Jews, the policies uh, of the Israeli government. Secondly, the main idea behind Palestinian nationalism, as I've tried to show you, was secular nationalism. They always believed that they wanted to create a secular state in which Christians, Muslims, and Jews would live together with equality uh, in the historic land of Palestine, uh, with equal rights between all of these communities. Uh, this is, of course, not the point of view, arguably, of other political parties and other political forces, but this is the main form of Palestinian nationalism as it has been um, articulated in the 20th century. And if we convert this war into a religious war, if we present the narrative that this is a conflict between Muslims and Jews, then, of course, we not only risk alienating and isolating all those people who don't, dis who don't agree with Zi the politics of Zionism, but, of course, we also shoot ourselves in the foot by alienating and isolating all those people who have seen, that, um, uh, who have seen the results of anti-Semitism in the context of Europe and don't want to repeat that history any further. So with that, I'll bring my... Uh, my talk to a conclusion, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. That you Comrade Tamur, I think thanks for an extremely illuminating, very rational, very reasonable, logical, and uh, and and uh, historical sequ hist historically sequential uh, evol evolution of events, which led to today's situation. And I think you can't uh, uh, you can't get get any even a needle between all these arguments and sequence of history. With this, and thank you very much for that. And with this, we would like to invite our attendees and thank you very much who have been listening very patiently and, and uh, with, with a lot of concentration about all the, all the talk Dr. Temur gave. So please uh, raise your hands and, uh, and put, put your questions forward. Thank you. Yes, uh, Masood Mirza sir, please uh, unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, Tamur Saab. Thank you for this interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Uh, this provided us a deep insight in this complicated matter. Uh, my question is like this. We all know that the USA is the closest ally of Israel. And it is also an open secret that there is a very strong Israel, pro-Israel lobby in the USA. This lobby is represented in the form of American Israel Public Affairs uh, Committee, uh, AIPAC. My question is that how Israel influences the American foreign policy through this uh, powerful uh, political lobby, please. Um, well, I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on APAC, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and people seem to, to think that uh, they often give the metaphor of the tail that wags the dog, by which they mean that uh, America is beholden to Israeli interests um, and uh, the foreign policy of the United States of government is really formed by Israel rather than by, <laughs> by America itself or shaped by it. And whereas I don't deny that the APAC has a lot of influence of, on American policy, but I want to point out to the audience that um, this uh, argument has been exaggerated beyond all reasonable proportion. America had its own, uh, rather the United States of America had its own very important strategic interests in the Middle East. Uh, these included, of course, the first and foremost, that they wanted to ensure that uh, amongst Arab countries, 
the Soviet Union would have little or no influence. And if you look at the conflict in 1956, the United States of America is not partial to Israel. It wants to, in fact, stay impartial in that conflict. It, uh, it in fact, utilizes its clout with the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, the US government at that time basically said that IMF will no longer make loans to Britain and France if they do not retreat from this, uh, uh, from the 56 war, et cetera, et cetera. So the American government at that time, the American state at that time was uh, wanting to play a relatively neutral role in this entire situation. You cannot say that in 1956, they were, uh, you know, they, they, were, uh, they were on the side of Israel. Um, so, but with the victory of Nasserite forces in the Swiss Canal, a, a big change occurred in the context of the Arab countries, which was that Arabs were inspired by Nasser to, uh, to become themselves socialist and to adopt socialist economic policies, political policies, and international policy, which was non-aligned. And many Arab countries wanted to ally themselves with the Soviet Union rather than with Britain and France, because Britain and France are the original colonial powers of Arabia. And America was allied to Britain and France against the Soviet Union. And so they want, so the way Americans saw, the American elite saw the situation after 1956 was that Nasser was basically a communist. Of course, Nasser was not a communist, but they thought, they thought whatever distinction is, is, is present is irrelevant. In the field of international politics, in the context of the Middle East, Nasser is, uh, is uh, spreading the influence of socialism and the Soviet Union in the Middle East. So it was to stop this influence in the Middle East, the Soviet Union, and of the ideas of socialism that the Americans after 1956, before 56, it's mainly the French that are supporting the Israelis. The weapons with which the French, are, the Israelis are fighting are mainly French weapons. But after 1956, the Americans now get into the game and they decide that they have to, they have to strengthen and support Israel against Egypt and Syria. They have to teach Nasser a lesson. And that's when the strategic change occurs. So it's fact, see, it's the fact that um, that uh, it's the Cold War that causes it. It causes it. It's the fact that the Americans think that the only way they can stabilize the Middle East, which is now in the throes of a of a left wing mm. na national and uh, nationalist uh, Arab socialist revolution, the only way they can stabilize it is by supporting Israel, and that's what they do throughout the Cold War. From sorry, from fifty six. Then till the end of the Cold War, the Americans are supporting Israel mainly because they, they, they view that it is Israel that can police the region, and prevent the Arabs from moving in the direction of socialism. But after the end of the Cold War, Israel, uh, uh, even today, America continues to support Israel. So you may ask, all right, that explains why they supported Israel during the Cold War, but what's going on now? Well, what's going on now is that after 9-11-2001, when the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, etc., was attacked, were attacked, Israel uh, reached its own importance to the Americans in the context, in the larger narrative of the war on terror. So Israel said, you are fighting the war on terror, you are being attacked. We have been fighting the war on terror for a lot longer than you've been fighting. Look at the Hamas, these suicide bombings against. You just experienced that bombing. Oh, we've been seeing them uh, for a very long time. We've been seeing them since the period of the PLO and 1988, etc. So we can ensure Israelis basically we can ensure that you win America. We win the support us, we will help you win the war on terror. So they recast their settler colonial ambitions into the war of terror. And because of that, they will continue to receive 
support from the from the Americans. Okay, thank so you. That's that's the real game. So America has, U.S. has its own interest in supporting Israel the way it has supported Israel. Thank you very much. Next thank question: uh, who, who would like to have a go? I see Pradeep Joshi uh, raising hands. Pradeep, sir. Namaskar. Uh, Namaskar. Tamur sir, बहुत अच्छा लगा आपका. It was quite an enlightening thing. I was not aware of lots of facts which uh, you. you mentioned, especially that uh, you mentioned that all the Jews do not support Israel, and uh, that is a very very new perspective in my opinion to resolve the conflict between Israel and Palestine. There millions of people are living in a misery for a very very long time, and if these Jews who are not supporting yes. Israel, if they can combine and put a pressure along with. Uh, and since most of these jews out, who are living outside israel are a powerful lobby politically so i think uh, some effort should be made uh, to bring them into the picture so that pressure could be put on israel to end this misery what do you think about this uh, dr tamur may i before you answer this question because i have a very similar question in the chat box from our tyra abdullah uh so you may be able to take Gee. both questions at the same time she is writing and i'm reading from the chat box sure i can i'll try and answer both questions uh, uh, so pradeep let me start with your uh, yeah. okay ji i'll read out the question no problem okay so sure. pradeep Thank let you. me start Thank with your uh, uh, yeah let me start with your question the uh, 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 orthodox religious uh, the uh, sorry the orthodox religious jews are very much part of the movement uh, which is opposed to zionism across europe um and uh, in the united states of america so whenever there are big palestine pro palestinian rallies you will see that they uh, that uh, and you can google this you can see that uh, the orthodox uh, uh, jews uh, come to those rallies they bring palestinian flags to those rallies uh you know they wear the palestinian kafaya into in, in those rallies uh they support palestinians in those rallies um and uh, and they also uh you know um they they've been arguing and they've been uh, presenting the narrative that zionism does not represent jews at all uh not only that uh, they even go to sometimes go to very extreme extents they say that uh, they have they sometimes burn the israeli flag Uh, and in fact within israel the the orthodox jews uh, yeah, led a huge movement in which they said that they refused to serve in the israeli army you know in israel every person has to serve in the army but the orthodox jews on religious ground said we refuse to serve in the israeli also on political ground but the main case was a religious one they said we refuse to serve in this zionist army we are not zionists um uh etc uh, etc et uh so what i should mention is that the uh, israeli communist party the communist party of israel has also played a very important role i neglected to mention any of their great struggles and movements but they have uh, this is a, the party called uh, makai uh, has been at the forefront of the movement against uh, against zionism uh, for decades now and has been at the forefront of the peace movement in israel for decades now and here's another interesting thing that you may uh, not realize it is that uh, israeli society itself you know is bifurcated between the um, european jews and the uh, uh, what we call the mizrahi jews who are uh, middle east so the middle eastern jews are jews who used to live in israel arab countries many uh, the israelis spoke to the iraqi government where there was a more than a million jews who used to live in iraq and they said please send them all over to us so million jews went from iraq to israel well less than a million but you know a huge number of jews uh, maybe 800000 or something I forget the exact number it's massive number went and settled in israel from iraq now these are these are arab jews right they they are arabs they are not uh, european jews they are not settler jews in the in that european settler colonial sort of jews and they are also you know within israel they are they have you know culturally speaking they are not considered equal to the european jews etc etc and then of course there are palestinians who live in israel uh there are loads and loads of palestinians who live in israel uh, you know arabs who live in israel so makai has been working amongst the arab community in israel whether they are christians or muslims or jews or whatever these people consider themselves to be arabs they speak arabic uh, that's why they consider themselves to be arabs and um, they don't speak hebrew and so on and so forth they speak arabic and uh, makai is one of the principal representatives within israel of the arabs who live within israel 
So this is another interesting thing, which is that in Israel, there are many, many people, and they, they are not a small party, they have representatives in the parliament of Israel as well. So that's another significant section uh, of Jewish opinion or of people who are in Israel who oppose Zionism. And then finally, there's Peace Now. Peace Now is an NGO, which is a huge NGO, which is one of the, uh, which has been uh, the umbrella group that has embraced all progressives and liberals and, you know, even orthodox Jews, et cetera, et cetera, against the warlike policies of Israel. They are the ones that have organized, you know, 400,000, sometimes 100,000 demonstration, et cetera, very important organization. So Peace Now has also played a very important role in saying, okay, we Israeli state has got to stop its war. But remember that all these, and they are the ones, by the way, who decriminalized into the PLO. Peace Now played a very important role in convincing the, as is first the public, and then the politicians, talk to Arafat, talk to Arafat. Uh, they are the ones that really played the key role in that. So, so you have people, Orthodox uh, Jews in, living in the West who oppose uh, you know, Zionism, then you have the entire spectrum of the left, uh, or, or nearly all communist parties, socialist parties, you know, even the majority of social democrats, anarchists, environmentalists, and so on and so forth, all of them feel that Zionism is, uh, you know, very, it was very brutal. The Israeli state is very brutal with the Arab population. So you have that, uh, and then you have people in Israel, and then of course you have people in the Muslim world. So yes, you're right. All of these things have to come together effectively. Why is the state of Israel nonetheless more effective than all these various movements? Well, because it's a state. The, these other things are movements rather than states as such. And states often obviously have militaries and power and control, a control which movements don't have at the same level. Uh, Tahir Abdullah uh, Puchti, why is there not a great expression of outrage at Israeli atrocities from progressive Israeli Jews and strong voices in support of Palestinian fundamental human rights? The way brave Yuri Avneri, uh, rest in peace, used to write from inside Israel and Noam Chomsky continues to speak up from the USA. Is Gash Shalom dead? So in Israeli politics, there was a very unique and interesting period in Israel, the post-Zionist period. The post-Zionist period is the period in which, uh, following the peace movement against the war in Lebanon, intellectuals, college students, and a whole host of people began to look at the history of Israel in a very different way. It started with a figure called Benny Morris, who is a historian who uh, looked at the declassified documents from 1948 and rewrote the history of 1948. And those documents showed that the Haganah had a deliberate policy of expelling the Palestinians so that the land could be cleared for Israeli settlements. Then after that came, of course, Yuri Avneri and came uh, Ilan Pape and many other historians, feminists and many other kinds of historians. This phase reached its highest point in the 1990s when the Oslo peace process was going on. The Oslo peace process was enormously popular in Israel and it was also enormously popular amongst Palestinians. For a brief period, there was a period in which people thought that this problem can now finally be solved. As I tried to show you, Oslo too ensured that it was not really solved. But uh, for a brief period, people thought it could be solved. The only people who thought it could not be solved were the religious Zionists on the right uh, of the spectrum of Israel and, the, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad on the right of the Palestinian spectrum. So what, the, uh, what Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the 90s started to do was they started doing these terrorist attacks and these, they, so they would bomb nightclubs in Israel, they would bomb cafes, et cetera, et cetera, or cinemas. This was, the result of this was in fact that the argument made by Netanyahu and the Likud party then managed to overwhelm the argument made by the Labour Party and Rabin's forces. Rabin, the Labour Party was saying, we've got to trade, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, territory for security. Whereas uh, uh, Netanyahu and the Likud were saying, oh, you know, this trade-off is a really bad trade-off, we should do this. So the suicide bombings basically gave the right wing of Israeli society an opportunity into saying, okay, look, the Palestinians are not ready to, 
any kind of peace that you're offering them. They are bombing our cafes. And they, you know, they, they exaggerated it and they presented it in, you know, made it much bigger, it ran on the news constantly, you know, those images, et cetera, et cetera. So really after the assassination of Rabin, an assassination that was undertaken by a right-wing religious Jew who killed Rabin precisely because Rabin, you know, was uh, shook hands with Arafat and decided that they would, you know, they would uh, call, they would uh, make peace, etc. So he was killed. That brought what we call the post-Zionist phase to a close. That really ended it. Although Ehud Barak came to power again, he was a Labour Party, but but the 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 post-Zionist academic phase and where students and pop the you know, general population was interested in this, came to a close. And finally, September 11th clinched it. After September 11th, uh, Likud and, as I said, uh, Netanyahu made the argument that these, they're all terrorists and we've got to fight terrorism just as America is fighting terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan and we have ISIS and we have Al-Qaeda and we have Osama bin Laden, et cetera, et cetera. In the context of, the, of uh, Palestine, we have Hamas and Islamic Jihad and so on, and we've got to fight them. So that more or less closed the argument, you know, within the context of, sadly, within the context of Israel. But I must say that uh, the Israeli peace movement, peace now, as well as Makai, uh, especially after the recent incidents, you know, have been regalvanized and are fighting again. It's a long struggle. It's a big fight, but I hope that they will one day accept wanted to ask some question. Niza Nizamullah, please, can you unmute yourself? Dr. Temo Saab, aapka bohut shukriya, aapne bohut zyada enlightened tariqe se is issue ke upar baat kiya. Lekin, mein aap se ye sawaal pushna chahta hoon ke ye jo conflict hai Israel or Palestine ka, ye to bohut zyada time se chal raha hai in dhogun ka. तो हमारे पास पहले पीएलओ बना अभी हमारे पास हमास है उन लोगों के पास इस किस्म के ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बनते गए फिर वो ब्रेक हो गए आ, फिर वो ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हमास के तौर पर हमारे सामने आया लेकिन मेरा ये सवाल आपसे है कि ये इजराइल और प्लेस्टाइन रिलीजियस इशू को रिमूव करके एक सेकुलर स्टेट बनकर नहीं रह सकते हैं बहुत शुक्रिया निजामुल्ला देखिए पहली बात तो ये निजाम साहब के पीएलओ और हमास का मुआवजना नहीं आप कर सकते क्योंकि पीएलओ एक पॉलिटिकल पार्टी नहीं सॉरी आई शुड स्पीक इन इंग्लिश पीएलओ जो है ना इज नॉट अ पॉलिटिकल पार्टी पीएलओ इज एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इम्ब्रेसिंग मेनी डिफरेंट पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज फतेह इज अ पोलिटिकल पार्टी पी एल पी इज अ पोलिटिकल पार्टी डी एफ एल पी इज अ पोलिटिकल पार्टी हमास ऑल्सो इज अ पोलिटिकल पार्टी सो पी एल ओ alliance of many 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 different political parties that were all palestinian nationalists in one way or another uh, that's why plo represented the uh, not just arafat not al fatah i'm talking plo represented the vast majority of the spectrum of palestinian national opinion uh, it was the true representative in my opinion it was not one party it was a set of parties and they represented the opinion of Palestinian nationalism. Hamas was invited to join the PLO by Yasser Arafat. They, want, they refused because they wanted too many seats within the governing body of PLO. They were not ready to, to you know, uh, they wanted 40 seats. I think Arafat was ready to offer them 20 or 23 seats or something. The exact numbers may be wrong here. I'm just trying to recall by memory, but this, is the, this was the issue. As long as Yasser Arafat was alive, he was considered by the Palestinians, even those who disagreed with his policy, with individual decisions he made, he was and is Palestinians to be the father of their nation. He is Mr. Palestine himself. He is the one that really created, uh, you know, the idea or, uh, or, or really brought together Palestinians into the, such that Palestinians can call themselves a people because Palestinians are very, very spread out all over the place. So really, you know, he was, he symbol, symbolized um, Palestine. Um, so, uh, so I want to clarify that, that the, the Palestinian national, the dominating trend of Palestinian nationalism 
is and remains secular, not religious. Although Hamas has won the election, but if you look at history as a whole, this is what you find. Uh, how will this, uh, now the second part of your question was, can't you have just one Muslim state over here and one Jewish state over there? Um, no, no, you can't. Firstly, because Israel also has Muslims within it. They can't, and, uh, and many are trying to expel Muslims. That's a violation of their human rights, right? They live there, they, they deserve there. So you have a ethnically pure or religiously pure Israel, uh, Jewish state. And uh, vice versa, the Palestinian areas, you have Christians living there, you have uh, you know, other uh, communities living there and you can't have an ethnically or religiously uh, you know, pure Muslim state either. Uh, these, these kind of pure states, wherever they have been created have been disasters for those people who are not part of that community. And last but not least, how can we forget that this is the land where the three great religions of the world originate. This is a land where, uh, you know, this is where the uh, Israeli state was first created. Um, uh, you know, uh, this is the land of uh, Hazrat Dawood, David. It's a holy land, uh, the last remaining temple, the last remaining Western wall of the ancient temple is a holy place for Jews. This is a land where uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. It's so vital to the, to, to the history of Christianity for this reason. This is also the land where uh, Muslims feel that uh, the prophet, uh, you know, uh, ascended to the uh, to the heavens, and that's where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is created. So, at the, from that point, so it's holy to all three religions. So all three have to, at some level, share this land. They can't create religiously, how should one put it, uh, hermeneutically sealed states. They can't create pure religious states. Anyway, dunya ka ki jo aur tarikh ki jo lehar hai, wo hume yehi sikha rahi hai ki hume ek dusre ke saath rehna aur jeena sikhna hai. Hume ek dusre se alada nahi reh sakte aur jee sakte. Thank you very much, Doctor uh, Temur. Uh, now, uh, Faruqi Shab, can you please ask your question? Very good afternoon from Europe, uh, Temur. I would like to know that so many contradiction within the Palestinian authorities, within the overall uh, Palestinian movement, like uh, on one hand Hamas and within the PLO, there are a lot of contradictions and also Fatah. There are a lot of uh, resentment against Abbas and there is whole movement uh, going on and now discussion taking place, how to really de Abbas and Palestinian authorities using police against Palestinian people. I mean, what sort of violence at the moment going on there? So Abbas is basically acting now on the behest of enemy or uh, for that matter, so-called international community, which is really taking very unjust line on recent attack uh, in, in Gaza in Palestine, uh, against the people of Palestine and also uh, extremist movement like Hamas, which is uh, not contributing anything to resistance, but rather converting whole world opinion against Palestinian people. So how are you going to really uh, reach to solution uh, the contradiction within the Palestinian movement? Thank you. Farooq, the thing is that uh, you are... I mean, you're not wrong. You're absolutely right that we have all these uh, issues and problems within the Palestinian national movement now. And uh, Mahmoud Abbas is being criticized and uh, to, very, to a very large extent deserves to be criticized uh, on many, many things. Uh, on certain things, he does not deserve to be criticized, but he's also being hammered on those. Uh, and also, I think progressives like us would not like to support religious politics of the kind that is promoted by Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and especially uh, attacks against civilians is something that I feel is... Uh, uh, something that I abhor completely. Um, and there's also other com complexities in the entire matter. But let's, let's try and understand that uh, the Palestinian people are not a political party that has to sort itself out in the same way that a political party has to sort itself out. They are a nation. And in a nation, you have many, many diverse views, just as you have very diverse views 
within Pakistan, you have many diverse views within India, you have many diverse views within Bangladesh. Now, nobody would argue the case that since I do not agree with Indian, uh, a, a given Indian politician or a given Indian government, that I should therefore not allow India to be an independent country. Nobody would uh, entertain that particular kind of notion. Or nobody would entertain the notion that since I uh, prefer Steve Biko to uh, Nelson Mandela, th therefore I, I don't support, uh, you know, uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, 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 the struggle against apartheid or something of that sort. The independence of uh, the right of a nation to self-determination is not determined, should not be contingent upon as far as we are concerned upon uh, whether or not we agree with the politics of a given uh, of a given political party. Those anyway continue to change and will continue to change. Uh, today you have Mahmood Abbas, tomorrow you might have Marwan Bhagwati or Ahmed Sadat or someone else, right? Uh, these are all major figures within the context of Palestinian politics. Ahmed Sadat and Marwan Barghouti, of course, have been in prison for many, many years. Uh, but they are also contenders for uh, uh, to be leaders of the PLO and PA, etc. So my contention is that, and or for somebody sitting in India, or from somebody sitting in elsewhere, to say that the Palestinians should vote for this party or that party and have this leader and not that leader. You know what I'm trying to say? It's not right. Uh, it's up to the Palestinians to elect the leadership that they feel best represents their interests. And it's our duty only and only, I think, to, to argue the case for the right of Palestinians to have, to be able to live in peace, to have their own state, uh, to have uh, access to their land for their right of return, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, for them to be able to build a, a state which is uh, viable. Uh, with a contiguous territory uh, for the uh, for for them not to be walled off, uh, for them not to be shot at, and so on and so forth, and for them to have a decent economic political life. So I think that's the case that we need to build, and we don't need to go further than that. We don't need to say, "Okay, I support a, uh, I support Abbas, and I support uh, Hamas," because that's not our politics. At the end of the day, we're not Palestinians. We don't need to get involved with that politics. We are Pakistanis, or some of us are from India, some of us are from other countries, etc. It's for the Palestinians to determine what kind of politics they want their country to be, or they want their movement to be dominated by. It's for us to determine that uh, the principle that has to be enforced is uh, the right of uh, the Palestinian people to have a viable national life. That's the principle that we should support. Thank you. Let me, let me read one from, from Dr. Uh, Mubarak Lashari. And sure. he, he's saying being a progressive person, what should we understand of Hamas, Al Fatah, and PLO? To whom we should support, in your opinion? I don't. I mean, personally, uh, we have the equivalence of. Uh, I don't support the Hamas narrative. I don't support the narrative of the Islamic Jihad, and I think that's a that's not a narrative that's going to be successful in the context of uh, of the Middle East. I think it's going to very easily play into the hands of the Zionists. Who are in any case trying to portray all Palestinians as terrorists and Islamic fundamentalists. And so I don't see that narrative as being very successful. Moreover, we've also seen that uh, Islamic fundamentalism has come with a whole host of problems as far as women's rights are concerned and rights of minorities are concerned and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I don't support the narrative of Hamas. Uh, uh, at the same time, I have lots of issues with Mahmoud Abbas and, uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, you know, he especially getting uh, on the getting training from the United States, etc., and even uh, in order to crush, you know, many Palestinians, as you mentioned, through the Palestinian police force, and uh, what I spoke about earlier in my lecture, how he changed the powers that the PM and president had. That was very blatantly. It was very blatantly obvious that, you know, he was manipulating the situation such that he should not have to, had to accept the election result of 2006 which in my mind is an un undemocratic practice. So I think that, uh, you know, there needs to be criticism of that. Um, so I think, why can't we just leave this question open? Why do we have to pick a party amongst the Palestinians? I don't necessarily see that as, a, as a, something that we have to do. Um, we don't have to accept the politics of Hamas to nonetheless accept that Gaza is being, you know, uh, is, uh, uh, that what is going on with Gaza is uh, you know the equivalent of a it's become the equivalent of a mass uh, ref, a refugee camp or a mass prison of four people you know uh, these people are walled off within gaza 
uh, the population density is so high. It's one of the, has the highest densi de populace, uh, de population density in the world. Water facilities are in a mess. Sewage facilities are in a mess. There are no jobs. People are unemployed. There is rubble everywhere. There are no houses that are standing. Whenever Israel feels that, uh, you know, this house has a terrorist in it, they missile attack it and destroy it. Uh, they have a policy of assassination and killing people. We can stand against these policies as human rights abuses while distancing ourselves from the narrative and politics of Hamas. We don't have to accept the politics of Hamas to accept that the human rights of people in Gaza should not be trampled upon by Israel. Not that complicated in my view. Temur, uh, there is a question. Uh, there are actually uh, many people. Uh, some have uh, uh, just um, emailed me. And it is mm -hmm. related to the one state solution. Uh, right. Is it viable? Because uh, many, many have been professing and many have been, uh, yeah, they, they think that this is, a, this is a solution to bring uh, all the parties back and then uh, Israel and, you know, West Bank and Gaza and, yeah, it should be a one land and uh, then uh, a state. What is right. your opinion on that? So I think this is a complicated question. And what makes it complicated is, number one, originally, nearly the entire left uh, at that time uh, was in favor that uh, Jews and Muslims and Christians should all live together in that land. So initially, everybody was in favor of, let's say, a one state solution. But eventually, what people saw was that there was uh, the, the rise of the aspirations of Palestinian nationalism. So in that context, where you had the rise of Palestinians wanting to form a state, uh, then, you know, you had this sort of temporary and, uh, let's say, two-state solution that was presented. But the way in which Oslo II then uh, implemented or executed what we call the two-state solution ensured that while one state was entirely viable, the other state was not really a viable state. You do not have a viable state if that particular state or authority or entity is broken up into 164 little units <laughs> and deprived of natural resources, deprived of um, uh, you know, the ability to, to uh, sovereignty over some of its key uh, cities, like, for example, East Jerusalem. So, in other words, what you have today, by default, in a certain sense, is a one-state solution in the sense that what you have is the Zionist state. Uh, which is not ready to accept, in my opinion, a two-state solution. They are the ones that have scuttled and, and undermined and destroyed the opportunity of a two-state solution uh, by imposing draconian measures on the Palestinian Authority, which, uh, you know, which is uh, preventing that as a viable state. So you have a one-state solution. Here you have it. It's the Zionist state. The problem is not whether it's one state or two state, in my opinion. The problem is Zionism as a settler colonial project. That's the problem. So if it's whether it's one state or two or three, as long as you have this uh, project of settler colonialism, which has, uh, uh, you know, uh, disinherited people from the land, from their own land, uh, I think you're going to continue to have problems in that region of the world. Settler colonialism has to be undone. Uh, and the the understanding was that perhaps if the Palestinians could create their own state, there they would be free of the influence of their settler colonialism. But that didn't happen. It didn't happen because uh, they were still, as I said, under the influence of the Israelis. There was the, uh, the PA was not a viable state. So I'm happy to go with a one state solution or a two state solution that I think is not the real issue. The real issue is the settler colonial nature of the Zionist state itself. That has to change. Equal rights for all people have to come about. And if they are unwilling to give them, and they will be unwilling to give them because they cannot, the problem for the, the settler colonial state is that if they give Palestinians equal rights, if they give Arabs equal rights and give, allow Palestinians the right to, re, to return, then the entire settler colonial project falls apart. That is something that the Zionist state is not ready to accept. That's why the two-state solution has not worked. And they will also ensure that the one-state solution doesn't work, because whatever one-state solution we uh, propose 
because they will continue along the path that they have selected for themselves, which is a path in which they want to establish themselves as a settler colonial state. That's the real issue at hand. Vaseem has a question. Vaseem? Yeah, Vaseem, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sab. Uh, one question. Um, uh, in, uh, man, in many uh, uh, Muslim countries uh, around Israel and Palestine, you see this uh, prevalent argument of, re uh, of religion that the, the Palestinians are Muslim and the uh, the uh, Israelis are Jews, and because of this argument, a lot of anti-Semitism is uh, propagated. If you uh, in Pakistan or any uh, or in other Muslim countries, do you think that this rel religious argument has harmed the Palestinian cause in, instead of uh, strengthening it, strengthening it? Yes, absolutely. That's what I feel. I feel that this plays into the hands of uh, Zionists who wish to portray the aspirations of Palestinian nationalism as anti-Semitic uh, or rather anti-Jewish because Palestinians as elaborated many times are also Semites or at least many of them are. Um, but yes, it plays into their hands very easily if you, if you, uh, if you undertake a religious war, then uh, that's exact. in fact, that's exactly what the Zionists have been saying. The Zionists have been saying that the Palestinian movement Palestinian nationalism, uh, they often give the example of Haj al Amini, who was Haj al Amin, who was, uh, Haji al -Amin, who was uh, uh, you know, one of the leaders of the Palestinian uh, uh, national movement. And he supported, uh, uh, he supported Hitler. Uh, you know, he, he in fact, in, uh, he even tried to recruit people for Hitler. And so they often give this example that these people are inspired by Nazism. And they, they will destroy us and kill us all if we support them. So when, uh, when we also, when we openly come and say uh, things that uh, only a fascist would say, when people amongst us come and say things that fascists would say, when we, there are many people amongst us who will put posts that uh, celebrate fascists because they feel that this is some, somehow or the other they're expressing their hatred for Israel or something and they're expressing their solidarity for Palestinians. That plays into the hands of the Zionists you know, very easily, who have long argued, that have been arguing you know, for a long time that, uh, uh, that this is a fascistic movement and that the West needs to support Israel uh, against this terroristic and fascistic movement. So it, it, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster in my view. Yeah, uh, Doctor, uh, another question is regarded to can can we uh, compare um, a mass exodus of Palestine uh, with the Holocaust anyway? Or is this an argument uh, that can be given uh, to the world community? I think the argument that can be given to the world community is ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's an argument already been made by many academics. For example, Ilan Pape has made this argument in his book the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, Palestine. It's an argument that can be supported by what happened in the Nakba in 1948, that this was a deliberate policy to expel the Palestinians from their lands, to take over their lands, which under the definition of ethnic cleansing by the United Nations, which comes under the definition of ethnic cleansing as elaborated by the United Nations. So I think we can make that argument, but I think genocide would be a very difficult argument to make uh, because uh, what happened in Europe in uh, between 1940 and 45 was uh, on a scale uh, and uh, you know that was murder on an industrial scale and uh, there they you know brought people together and gassed them to death as you saw in i mean as you know probably in Auschwitz and so on and so forth so here the policy was basically to push them out to expel them which is a different policy from capturing them the policy of the nazis was to capture them and then bring them into these death camps and eliminate them in the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands so the policy of these Zionists has been to push them out, push them out so that they can take over the land. So this is a different policy. So I don't think an equivalent is, is correct, uh, but I think the argument can be made and should be made that this constitutes the ethnic cleansing of a population of the Palestinians. The question is that the Palestinians, especially the Muslims, have become very weak in the first place. 
जी बिल्कुल ऐसे ही है अभी वो कुछ नहीं हासिल कर सके तो क्या इतनी कमजोरी में इंटरनेशनल एस्टेब्लिशमेंट की मदद के बगैर वो अपना वतन या अपने लिए कोई खिता जो है वो बाकायद वो मुस्तकिल तौर पर हासिल कर सकते हैं या आपके ख्याल में इंटरनेशनल जो एस्टेब्लिशमेंट अगर वो कोई हल नहीं करना चाहती कभी भी इस मसले को तो ये हल हो सकता है थैंक यू बड़ा अच्छा सवाल है जी और नहीं हल नहीं हो सकता Uh, और uh, जब तक के मेरा ख्याल इंटरनेशनल कम्युनिटी सपोर्ट ना करे फलस्तियों को इंटरनेशनल uh, सपोर्ट बिल्ड करना इंतहाई जरूरी है और यही वजह है कि जो डेमोस्ट्रेशन uh, मैं यूरोप के अंदर देखता हूँ अमेरिका के अंदर देखता हूँ फ्रांस के अंदर देखता हूँ पूरी दुनिया के अंदर नजर आती हैं वो फलस्तियों के लिए इंतहाई अहम है क्योंकि उसके उन डेमोस्ट्रेशन के नतीजे में uh, जो उन, उन मुल्कों की हकूमतें हैं वहाँ पे पब्लिक ओपिनियन जो है वो फेलस्टाइन के फेवर में मूव कर सकता है और करेगा भी और इस इस वजह से भी मैं समझता हूँ कि फलस्तियों के हवाले से जो नैरेटिव होना चाहिए हमारा वो किसी भी सूरत जो है किसी किस्म के एंटाटिज्म के साथ जुड़ना नहीं चाहिए और बिल्कुल उससे दूर रहना चाहिए क्योंकि उसके बगैर जो है हमें इस कॉज को मैं सपोर्ट दुनिया के अंदर नहीं मिलेगी क्योंकि कोई भी बंदा दुनिया के अंदर किसी किस्म की ऐसी मूवमेंट को सपोर्ट नहीं करना चाहेगा जो कि मजहब की बुनियाद पर किसी दूसरे पर हमला कर दे हमला अवर हो जाए अब ये वो तारीख का वो दौर खत्म हो चुका है जब लोग जो हैं वो मजहबी जंगे चाहते थे तो और करते थे तो इस वजह से मैं समझता हूँ कि एक सेक्युलर नैरेटिव ही फलस्तीन के अतबार से जो है वो कामयाब हो सकता है और फलस्तीनी नैरेटिव सेक्युलर ही रहा है मास हमास और इस्लामी जहाद के और बाकी तमाम जो पार्टीज हैं जो डोमिनेट नैरेटिव फलस्तीन के बारे में रहा है वो यही रहा है और अब तो मोर रिसेंटली 1988 में जब हमास बनी थी उस वक्त उनका नैरेटिव बड़ा डिफरेंट था मगर अब तो हमास भी इस मामले में थोड़ा सा पहले से अकलमंद हो चुका है इस सेंस में कि जो 1988 का चार्टर था उसमें तो उन्होंने सब यहूदियों को बुरा कहा हुआ था मगर अब हमास इज वेरी केयरफुल कि अरबी जबान में तो वो अभी भी यहूदी बोलते हैं मगर अंग्रेजी जबान में जितनी भी उनकी अनाउंसमेंट वगैरह होती हैं उसके अंदर वो जैनिज्म को कसूरवा ठहराते हैं वो यहूदियों का अटैक अब नहीं करते हैं तो हमें भी उससे सीख लेना चाहिए हम अगर वो सीख गए हैं जो फ्रंट लाइन में खड़े हैं तो हम अभी भी वही लगे हुए हैं वही प्रोपागेंडा करी जा रहे हैं तो हमारा जो जो मुद्दा होना चाहिए जो हमारा पॉइंट होना चाहिए वो ये है कि जाइनिज्म इज अ प्रॉब्लम यहूदियों के साथ हमें कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं यहूदियत के साथ हमें कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है जूस के साथ जूडिज्म के साथ हमें किसी किस्म का कोई मसला नहीं होना चाहिए यही नेरेटिव जीत सकता है और जब ये नेरेटिव जीतेगा तो तभी हुकूमतें भी तभी हुकूमतें भी फलस्तियों को सपोर्ट करेंगी और जब बैन अवी तौर परूमतें फलस्तियों को सपोर्ट करेंगी तो तभी फलस्तियों का मसला भी हल होगा but also for the first time in the history by many arab states all uh, which led to an almost unified inclination to favoring the state of israel that's my question sir ji thank you it's a complex question ji magar dekhiye usko agar disaggregate if we disaggregate what's going on in the middle east uh, along different countries then you realize that uh, Uh, the various countries that were in conflict with israel had very specific issues with which they were in, uh, because of which they were in conflict with israel for example uh, between let's say uh, for example between after 1956 of course there was the suez canal crisis but between 1967 and 1978 the main issue with respect to egypt and israel was the sinai peninsula as well as control over the suez canal um, israel wanted that uh, they should be allowed access through the uh, through the canal and at one point nasser threatened that he would close the canal to the israelis etc etc so very specifically once that was that, that issue was resolved with respect to the sinai peninsula and access to the canal etc then after that we saw that the Isra- the egyptians basically took themselves out of the conflict similarly with respect to the jordan their main issue with israel even by 1948 uh, the jordanian monarchy was very much willing to accept peace with israel in fact that's why abdullah the first was uh, assassinated he was ready to accept peace with israel as long as israel was ready to concede the west bank to jordan 
Uh, now that was taken over in 67, as we know, the West Bank was conquered by them. And then later Jordan decided that it would, much later, uh, when after Oslo, in fact, in 1994, Charles Han basically signed, uh, you know, uh, gave up all claims on the West Bank, which of course meant that very soon after that, Jordan could have a peace treaty with Israel as well and did. Um, so that was Jordan's main sort of motivation there. Uh, Syria's main issues remains uh, over the Golan Heights with respect to, uh, to Israel. And uh, Lebanon, of course, because uh, Israel for a long time had a buffer zone in southern Lebanon, that remained a very contentious issue between Lebanon and Israel. Each of these states has, you know, sort of fought the Israelis and lost in military engagements against Israel. And after having lost, Israel has offered them territory in exchange for peace, which most of these states have now accepted. Now, no state which is not directly contiguous to, to Israel is, uh, is in that kind, can be in that kind of conflict with respect to Israel. So, the, so many of the other states, uh, you know, have also fallen in, sadly fallen in line. But I think that the key, the biggest key to the entire scenario was what happened in Egypt. Because Egypt really was at the heart of the Arab uh, nationalist and socialist upsurge. And when Egypt basically conceded defeat after 78 Camp David, that is when all the other countries on their own were not strong enough, were not large enough, did not have large enough militaries, did not have large enough economies to be able to take on a conflict of this size and nature. And when Egypt took itself out of that conflict, it also simultaneously took itself out, it also simultaneously, let's say, um, uh, conceded that it would no longer uh, lead the Arab socialist upsurge. Uh, it conceded its leadership uh, as far as that particular, uh, uh, all the, the aims of that national liberation uh, all those, you know, the, those aims of national liberation were concerned. And this led to, in, in the context of Middle Eastern politics, the eventual decline of Nasserism and pan-Arab socialism, uh, Arab nationalism. It led to the decline. And conversely, you saw that both Iran and Saudi Arabia, which had fundamentalist regimes, Islamic fundamentalist regimes, were able to consolidate their ideological hold over the politics of, of Arabian countries. And uh, so, so that's why now you see that the religious point of view has come to dominate both in Sunni as well as in Shiite majority countries. It's the decline of Egypt and the rise of Saudi Arabia and also on the other hand, Iran, which has changed the entire political and intellectual um, you know, fabric. So towards closing, uh... And again, I started this uh, introduction with, with the Noam Chomsky's and Tyra Abdullah incidentally mentioned Noam Chomsky's. I will start the closing also with one of his, uh, which in fact uh, also touches the point uh, which uh, Dr. Tamur made. The last paradox is that the tale of Palestinians from the beginning until today is a simple story of colonialism and dispossession. Yet the world treats it as a multifaceted and complex story, hard to understand and even harder to solve. I mean, after looking at this history, what, what Dr. Tamur just illustrated, it becomes pretty clear that we that there are lots of powers it is in their interest to keep this a very complex, uh, uh, you can actually, this issue as is a very complex issue, you can bring it down basically as Dr. Tamur very nicely illustrated to a simple story of colonialism and dispossession. As, as long as you do not address these fundamental issues of colonialism, dispossession, uh, I mean, uh, taking the territories, driving them out of their home, not giving them basic rights, it is, it is hard to resolve any of these issues. And this is the illustration of what Dr. Temur was, uh, was as I said repeatedly in our discussion. This is a pretty simple illustration. You deem, it, it's actually a no-brainer. You don't even need to read the, any text. If you just simply look at it, this is the history of colonization, dispossession, ex, uh, exploitation, and ever-shrinking right to exist for Palestinians. Now, how, how this could be a viable 
uh, state or a viable nation even or in viability in any sense in economy e economic terms and social terms and political terms and territorial terms so there can never be but this is not the whole story because then there is another element to it which is the apartheid part of it because if we look at the rome rome institute the, the definition of the crime of apartheid as they say it is it the inhuman acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression hmm. and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining the regime so if you look exactly this this was about more about south africa but if you apply this to today's situation we see exactly the same kind of segregation in 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 uh, occupied territories or whole of israel which is achieved through implementation of two separate legal regimes for jewish israelis and the palestinians living in the same area so there are two kinds of people living in the same area but the settlers the people who are who are occupied those territories they are governed by israeli civil law and the people who are occupied i e the palestinians they are ruled or governed by the military law so you have in the same territory so this is this is I could be the probably the best uh, uh, illustration of uh, of apartheid another definition of uh, uh, apartheid in south africa was a former social system in south africa in which black people and people from other racial groups did not have the same political and economic rights as white people and were forced to live separately from white people now in this case if you just replace south africa with israel and black people with palestinians it has an absolute match and a total fit with the situation we are facing today and now let's uh, summarize this what dr dr uh, tamur uh, was was talking about and i think he very clearly explained to us with lot of evidence in fact historical evidence that jewish faith and zionism are two different things and also explained to us very well that if we kind of condemn jewish faith and turn this into a religious conflict we actually strengthen the hands of the occupiers as a, so it is a story of not of religions but of occupation expansion expansion and the violent of uh, violence of uh, violation of liberty of uh, of, of a complete uh, people there is a total power asymmetry therefore you can't even i mean palestinians are not even in a position to dictate anything or sit down and negotiate because the power asymmetry you see on the visual of the Uh, on the left if you if a kid is throwing a stones at the at the most powerful and and, and uh, most innovative tank this is the power symmetry more or less we have and then the framing of violence by israel as self defense i mean the the if we look at holocaust and again it was explained very well that it was one of the most tragic events in the history absolutely right but framing the violence now in 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 israel against palestinians and packaging it as self defense and using the same holocaust which was a tragic event marketing it uh, to to kind of uh, uh, put palestinians in the bad light and rest of the world whoever critics so you dehumanize palestinians and every critic in the world of zionism or israeli politics not jews but israeli politics is met with a with a bombardment of uh, anti-semitism and so on and so forth so we i just mentioned the, the two parallel justice systems uh, which is clearly the apartheid and palestinians are never considered a part of the solution they are always part of the problem whenever anyone in the world or most of the powers in the world they sit together and talk about the solution the the palestinians are problem uh, not any other party and if we look at the narrative now within israel where al nakba was replaced by the narrative of people without land and uh, land with and the palestinians were uh, people with uh, uh, sorry the palestinian territory was a territory without people and and jews or israelis were people without land so they just came and took the empty land and this has been a kind of and it is absolutely not true you heard from dr tamur that uh, al nakba or the catastrophe it was actually mass exodus of 750000 palestinians who hoped that they will be back next week uh, so we leave it actually with all this explanation to your imagination and your own conclusions is this a battle of religions and if we 
framed it as a battle of religions, is it going to be a good thing for Palestinians or is it going to be a bad thing for Palestinians? So it's, it's really up to us to, uh, to kind of uh, decide on this point. Uh, other aspect, uh, and Dr. Thamu very nicely uh, mentioned about the human rights, that people treated equally in the same territory governed by the same law. So if we look at the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, it talks about dignity, which is right of every person, dignity, liberty, and equality. And that talks about right to life and the prohibition of slavery and torture, freedom of movement, the right of property, and the right to a nationality, spiritual, public, and political freedoms, freedoms of thought, opinion, expression, religions, and conscience, economic freedom, social and cultural rights, including health care. Now, this is a very short list from the, from the 30 articles of uh, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is right of every human being. Again, it's up to you to decide how many of the above rights which are mentioned and accepted universally by, by all countries, how many of these above rights do the Palestinians enjoy? So we, we, can, we can see that. And, and certainly they cannot enjoy in the current situation when they are occupied and Israel has been declared as the, as the nation, as a, as a Jewish state.